Japan has been forced to defend its annual whale hunt at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Australia brought a case against the country, accusing it of killing up to a thousand whales a year for commercial gain, rather than the scientific purposes that Tokyo claims. Less often in the headlines is Norway, which openly hunts whales for their meat. The Norwegian government says it supports the traditional industry and that the minke whales that migrate past its coastline are not endangered. The whalers themselves tend to avoid publicity because of the controversy surrounding what they do. But Joe Fidgen was granted access to a whaling boat on a recent hunting trip. Boom! The shock of the cannon judders through the old boat. It's a hit. The minky is motionless, maybe 30 yards away, the rope attached to the harpoon trailing in the water. The skipper, Jan, strains his small frame to haul in the catch. It doesn't give an inch. So Fred lends his considerable bulk to the task. He turns to me with a flicker of a grin. Now the work begins, he says. Fred is a paramedic by day. Whaling is like a vacation, he told me that afternoon as we'd sat in the crow's nest, scanning the sea for telltale puffs of vapour. It was a beautiful day to be out in the fjords. There were no clouds to muzzle the ferocious mountains guarding Lofoten's coast, and no wind to ripple the water. Perfect weather for hunting whales. We chugged on for hours without a sighting, giving me time to poke around the boat. At about 15 yards long, it was on the small side for a whaling vessel, just twice the length of its prey. It had been prowling these waters for 40 years and looked tired. The rusty cannon had claimed a couple of Jan's fingers a while back when it exploded as he attached the grenade. Oh, it's not dangerous work, he assured me. Accidents can happen in any job. The only problem is that I can't cover the bass anymore when I play the accordion. Jan is the easygoing sort. A lot of whalers wouldn't have had a woman on board. It's bad luck. Fred was less comfortable with my presence. Are you sure you're not an activist? He kept asking me. A couple of local boats were sunk some years ago in protest at the government's decision to resume whaling. It argued that the industry was important for a community that has lived off the sea since Viking times. Every whaler I met insisted that whales were eating too many fish, leaving too few for them. Many wanted to be allowed to hunt bigger whales, and seals too. The fuss baffles them. I was raised on a farm, Jan told me. We took care of the cows and the sheep and slaughtered them when it was time. For me it's no worse to take the life of a whale than to kill an ox. Whale is food. That's a lot to take on board when you've been raised on a diet of anti-whaling protests. But it's only 50 years since Britain stopped whaling, and in the days after the Second World War plenty of people were glad of the meat. I comforted myself that the kill would be quick. Nine times out of ten, I'd been told, the grenade detonated inside the whale's brain an instant death. Only this day, it wasn't going to plan. Three minutes had passed since the whale had been harpooned. For most of that time, it had been under the surface. Suddenly, it lurched into view, revealing a deep gash in its back where the harpoon had passed right through. Only now did I realise that it was still alive and trying to swim. Fred grabbed the rifle just as the whale dived again. The boat was tense. Two long minutes went by before the whale reappeared and Fred could finish the job. He turned to me, grim-faced. I want you to know it almost never happens like this, he said. The captain, Jan, took the blame, saying he misfired and was sorry it had happened. But these are practical men. This can happen in all kinds of hunting, he told me. If you shoot an elk, it might run into the forest and you don't manage to kill it until the next day. Flensing duty fell to Fred. He wore himself out over the next few hours, carving up the whale. I stroked it, its skin rubbed off on my fingers. Fred ripped off the blubber like Velcro. The stomach floated away like an obscene beach ball chased by seagulls. As he heaved the carcass into the water, Fred called out, Thank you for the meat. Eight huge stakes lay on the deck. They'd earn each of the crew a few hundred pounds. The meat is served rare, fried in butter and garlic, or smoked and eaten with crackers and sour cream. The locals go wild for it. They may not get to taste it for very much longer. Young people are choosing to live in the city so there's no one to man the boats. 
and that's natural, Jan shrugged. I'm 69 now. When I go ashore, this boat will be the last in the area. I disembarked, reflecting how little there was of Moby Dick's Captain Ahab in affable yarn and ambulance-driving Fred, and how different the sea from the slaughterhouse. Jufijan.